Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Anthony Mills. I'm the Executive Director of GINI Global Innovation Institute. It's our honor to have you here with us today. Uh, as you know, as most of you know, Global Innovation Institute is the world's leading professional certification, business accreditation, and membership organization in the field of innovation. So we encourage everyone to learn more about Global Innovation Institute, the website, is at GINI.org and learn more about our professional certifications and business accreditations. And we have authorized providers all over the world who deliver our training and assessment uh, services for us. So we have a directory of those on the website. We invite you to get to know those and uh, learn more about the Institute and pursue the certifications and accreditations. So our, our guest with us today uh, at our webinar is Ms. Julie Wagner. And I'd like to introduce Julie and tell you a little bit about her and what she'll be talking about, and then I'll turn the floor over to her. So Julie is the founder and president of the Global Institute on Innovation Districts, where she is currently leading a global network of 23 innovation districts around the world. With the ambition of advancing them both individually and collectively as true leaders in this fast evolving practice. To support this global network, as well as other districts elsewhere, Julie is leading a team of researchers in the development of cutting edge analysis on districts, including their R&D strengths and specializations, and their combined assets that create innovative and inclusive places. Julie is also playing a leading role in GIID Europe, a new not-for-profit organization that's designed to support district and other innovation geographies advancing in and across Europe. Julie is a prolific urban researcher and has co-authored two seminal papers, namely The Rise of Innovation Districts, A New Geography of Innovation in America, and The Evolution of Innovation Districts, The New Geography of Global Innovation. Julie has over 25 years of experience advancing cities and urban areas. For over the past decade, she served as a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution based in Washington, D.C. She's also a visiting scholar for the Assad Business School's Center for Global Economy and Geopolitics. Julie has co-authored several papers on the changing role of innovation in place, including innovation spaces, the new design of work, and advancing a new wave of economic competitiveness, the role of mayors in the rise of innovation districts. Julie holds a bachelor's degree in organizational communication from Northeastern University, as well as a master's degree in city planning from MIT. As a trained city planner, Julie previously served as a deputy planning director for the District of Columbia, where she developed the city's long range plan. Julie has received several planning awards for her work from both MIT and the American Planning Association. Today, Julie is based in Europe, where she continues to help advance the competitiveness of cities and regions globally, including Amsterdam, Copenhagen, London, Milan, Sheffield, Turin, Sydney, and Silicon Valley. She is also supporting the development of innovation districts in cities across Israel in her capacity as strategic advisor to Israel's National Economic Council. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Julie, who will be talking to us today about the rise of innovation districts around the world. Please join me now, if you will, in welcoming Ms. Julie Wagner. Julie, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate this time with all of you, and maybe we'll get a few more. I know it's a busy time of year, and so I'm, I'm pleased that this will be recorded. And um, what, I, what I wanted to do today is to give you sort of two perspectives at the same time. One, as a researcher, looking at data, looking at analysis to try to understand emerging trends, what seems to be connecting and what not, where are you demonstrating clear advantages quantitatively? And then to really then the other lens is as a practitioner that I've really worked in a number of districts on the ground, often for several years at a time, because the work is very, very difficult and it requires just a lot of touch points of, and frankly, enlightened leadership to really move the dial in this work. And so I'm gonna give you sort of both lenses to give you a taste, a sense 
of what's happening out there in many cities uh, and other urbanizing areas that are sort of looking at this as an opportunity to not just strengthen the local and regional economy, but to actually grow local leadership as leaders, as true economic leaders taking hold and advantage of their assets to sort of go to the next level. So there's some real interesting elements to this work that is just amazingly uh, rewarding and fulfilling if you're, whether you're coming in on the ground as a leader or you're someone like me coming in to help support. So I will show some slides and the work is very visual I mean, it's very spatial, has a lot of data. So I am going to very much rely on a set of slides to sort of walk you through this story. So let me start here with this image. And let me start on this side, which is sort of the physical focused plans and people and even places. So often when I go to different cities around the world, I generally find sort of when I land, a sense of sort of where is their natural orientation, their focus. And I find often that places and very specific people, architects, designers, placemakers, are focused on iconic buildings, thinking about walkability, placemaking, how to connect people through design, where to put buildings and how to structure. There's a whole elaborate conversation underway in cities about how to do that and how to make these places magnetic for those reasons. Other places I go, they're very focused on the innovation story, the R&D story, or the economy story. But let's just sort of collapse it to say there's often a set of discussions sometimes within universities, medical institutions, governments, to be talking about what are the R&D clusters, where are the ones that are sort of punching above the regional or national strength, where should we be focusing and creating linkages, how we should be thinking about this. So I find that I, I, I often start the story with these places sort of in one bucket or the other. And it's what I find so interesting about these sort of two stories is that the power is really when they're combined along with a set of other things that really create this ultimate mashup of innovation and place and programs and networks and relationships and all these things that just start to create this powerful mix, which is a really different sort of set of ideas compared to places that often have one type of use or one type of use and maybe a little bit of amenities, but this is really about the mashup, okay? So when we wrote the paper, this original paper in 2014 called The Rise of Innovation Districts, and we coined it a new geography of innovation in America, and boy, how wrong we were to do that because it was clearly when we sent this out into the, to the atmosphere, right, through Brookings, it triggered a global response. So why did it trigger a global response where we said, we're seeing something different emerging here. We know that for decades, we've had you know, this emphasis on science parks and science corridors and other kinds of economic corridors, but we're seeing this more urban, more city strategy that's starting to sort of revive, building off of strong educational institutions with a strong R&D portfolio, medical institutions that have a growing R&D portfolio as the backbone, but are clustering and connecting with companies and startups and all these all these kinds of actors, but in an environment that's valuing the mix, the city mashup mix that is fueled 
by things like proximity and density and greater levels of accessibility. And so we were, as researchers, inspired, right, to try to capture what we saw happening on its own in many different countries, different, different cities with different economic starting points, but were in many ways responding to a set of global and local trends that were creating this new storm or this new kind of investment and activity into cities where we would see new kinds of innovation, highly sophisticated innovation spaces getting designed and built and constructed for institutions and industry to work together in new ways to solve highly complex problems. And so these innovation districts that we've been working with have been eager to share many of their imagery. So I'll show you a few. So you have the inside of these buildings reconceiving what it could be to drive new solutions through open innovation, strong technology processes, and the ambition to drive new solutions through an institution and industry set of actors working together. But then outside, there could even be the equal amount of energy being placed on how to create places and programs and trainings and events and spaces for people to come together of different backgrounds to kind of say, this is a space that actually belongs to all of us. It's not just the sense of researchers or a set of workers from a select set of companies. A growing set of these districts focused very much on startups, right? We have this all over the world, but how then can that be strengthened through the right kinds of capital investments, the support, the mentoring, the physical spaces that they could go to with very low cost and how different districts started to play with this notion in very different ways where they were located, who they were sitting next to, a lot of experimentation and playfulness, finding ways to get people outside to not just be places moving between buildings, but to actually own those spaces for anyone of different ages. And back inside, really interesting kinds of prototyping and testing going on, often leaking out onto the streets and into public spaces when it makes sense to kind of reconceive the living lab notion and allowing others to test and see what's going on. Here's another kind of activity that's been growing and growing and growing in these districts, which are just its neighborhood amenities, parks, restaurants, stores, even small different kinds of cultural museums, schools, all of this really being supported by a lot of the activity that you can see in the back of this image, and this is in Winston-Salem, where they include housing right in the middle of this story within footsteps of all these other activities. And here's another example, within footsteps of R&D activity. So you can see how it creates this set of new kinds of collisions of very different people. Some are here to live, some are here to work, some are here to do both, but it changes the entire landscape and culture and community because it stretches the day. It's not just a nine to five place, it's a community that extends into the evening and on weekends. Really different sets of sort of characteristics and attributes, if you will. And this is perhaps my favorite photo because it pushes me to really keep going at this work, which is how these places become living labs for children to understand their potential role in the future to solve problems and how growing numbers of these districts are really valuing these younger generations to be sort of infused into how they're thinking about designing space and program and creating that mashup that I just described. 
It's all these things, and they're all doing it very differently. So there's not really one recipe. There's not a magic pill. It's really about these local leaders, often anchored by R&D strong medical institutions and universities that are driving and aspiring to create that broader ecosystem that often starts with them, but in no way stays only with them. It's the connection across them and companies of different sizes and thinking through how to transform the physical landscape in between these places to create this really interesting magnetic mix. So here are just some examples of different kinds of districts all over the world. There's one in Europe, there's one in the United States, there's one in Australia, there's one in Israel, just some examples. But look at how different they are, different sizes, different kinds of universities and medical institutions. And in our empirical analysis of these plus others, they are so radically different in their strength with specific biomedical and health science strengths that truly make them national, if not global leaders with a very, in other cases, a very strong mix of very different converging disciplines that are creating a really interesting almost mashup on how they're trying to solve problems around climate around cancer. So each of these have their own story, their own leadership style, their own physical way of how to redesign, but they have very strong values collectively about what it means to involve and include others in their story. Now, I, if, if we were to go back to this paper that I wrote in 2014, perhaps one of the longer parts of that paper was about the why. Why is this happening and why is this happening now? And there are a lot of different reasons. So there's like 20, 25 different reasons that we sort of saw kind of coming together. One of them, and I'm just going to highlight one, is sort of the natural market phenomenon that we had been able to stitch together by many different researchers looking at the spatial concentration of different industries. When we look far to the left, this R&D labs, that yellow, if you imagine that being one full circle, that's five minutes. That within those five minutes, they'll find in many places, clusters of R&D labs. Now, often these R&D labs are clustering around these universities or medical institutions. So you can see that story, but they like and want to be close to each other given highly trained talent, new tacit, highly complex, nuanced information they want to share, information and data that they may want to work on together. So this sort of spillover effect and also the innovation infrastructure that they possess is sort of encouraging a natural clustering phenomenon that we're finding largely around these types of actors. So this sort of market-led phenomenon is one of those factors contributing to the growth of this of innovation districts, largely in cities or in areas that are thinking about how to increase the density, accessibility, and proximity. So we see this hyper-local phenomenon. Now you take that. And what we really see when we look at the data, so in the middle of this map, you actually have one innovation district in Amsterdam, and we looked at all the relationships that those institutions, we just use them as the proxy to look at the, how, who they're connecting with, who they're conducting research with, who they're collaborating with, who they're writing joint publications with, who they're citing, and it is an incredibly global story. Their strength is both a global and hyper-local story occurring at the same time, which is really interesting 
because you can see over time as we start to track who's citing who and how those are getting connected and how different research is changing and influencing what's getting commercialized, we can see an interesting feedback loop. So we like to play on this global and hyper-local phenomenon and really encourage districts in our research to be looking at and valuing both. Now you take that image and you put it against this image, which looks very different. And this is analysis by Richard Florida and Ian Hathaway in 2018. The data still holds even today, which is that the large majority, the largest majority of VC investment is still hyper-concentrated in just a few metropolitan areas. So here we have this interesting phenomenon of great innovation happening, a lot of collaborative innovation, a lot of people working together to start, start sorting out very complex problems, but then we have a concentration effect of VCs. So it is pushing a lot of these places that are in the gray to be thinking about how do we create enough density, critical mass set of activities to draw new attention and new investors toward us. Innovation districts is one of those strategies, which is to concentrate, grow, and then spread with success. So these are some of the districts that we've been tracking, the ones that are bright yellow are ones that are connected with us, where we're providing empirical analysis to help push with their agenda. And then the others are where we've been connecting, providing light support where we can. And the aim here really is how these places can feed off of each other, push each other, help each other, to accelerate ahead in ways that they value, very, very much rooted in values, what matters to us. And so when we, at Brookings, when we evaluated these districts, knowing how different they are, some are so strong in robotics, others in oncology and genetics, I mean, just entirely different stories, we did see a common trend where they all had sort of these important assets coming together and playing a central role. So it's not just focusing on the economic and it's not just focusing on that physical, like I talked about earlier in my first slide. Instead, what we're seeing is and looking at how they're spending time and resources, tremendous amount of energy being paid to building relationships, informal and formal network building. A lot of time is being invested here. And this includes engaging residents, neighborhoods, and communities that are often right there or even within these districts. So we find this really interesting. And then we also find What's so interesting is this desire on the part of sets of these districts to understand their economic strengths. So there could be those R&D clusters and saying, how do we make this bigger? How do we make it more magnetic? How do we create the critical mass? So thinking about how to transform that physical landscape to be in the service of these greater other ambitions. This is what we're capturing and codifying and basically turning it back out to say, this is what we're finding about you all. So we started with this sort of simple Venn diagram and as the years progressed with additional analysis, a lot more work on the ground, we started to layer in very specific strategies and a framework, if you will, for how districts are looking at themselves in a holistic way, but through several different kinds of lenses. We talked about quality place, that's that one in the yellow, but how to really understand where you're specialized 
And what does that look like? And is that a competitive advantage? Is that a comparative advantage? Where are you? Crit building critical mass is one of those fundamental aims that's to build and grow in a very strong orchestrated way that strengthens the ecosystem that importantly blends and balances with the physical moves and strategies. My last comment before moving on is this purple ring that connects all of them. This is, if I had to pick one thing, right, one, one item to focus on, it would be this. You could be starting with an organic set of strengths and actors that are just have come together over the years, but to move to that next level requires a level of intense and intensity and intentionality where it's developing visions, detailed ambitions, working across actors, working across sectors, to create a narrative that is across the district, that's more horizontal, that takes work. And so we call that organizing for success. So here's how that looks. You can easily build a building and have a company inside taking up that building, building its own competitive advantage. You could, at the same time, think of that maybe in a larger geography where actually there's a mashup within that building. So many, maybe there's startups and companies and maybe some institutions together, but looking at how they're gonna be creating a combined strategy, looking at their combined strengths, their combined R&D strengths, which is really interesting. So this is what we study and we experiment and we learn and we listen and we learn and they learn and we go back and forth as a collective trying to support this evolving model. So let me tell you where I see these districts are right now. They're all moving, they're growing in one way or another. Some are contracting a bit given the economy, given COVID, but they're adjusting, they're changing their strategies. And so that, that's the piece around how they're organizing for change. And so what I wanna do is highlight how some of these districts are really pushing themselves and the actual practice of building an innovation district as they themselves are evolving. So here's one way. We're increasingly see districts, rather than just saying we're really strong in biomedical and health sciences, or we're very strong in life sciences, or we're really good in platform technologies such as AI, big data, uh, and machine learning, these don't tell us anything about the impact that they could have. So there are groups of actors thinking more specifically about which kinds of problems they are truly equipped to handle. And that comes from deeper analysis and comparing themselves to others to truly demonstrate, okay, here is our hook. And so this is one example of some analysis that we did actually of a US national lab that was looking at, can we create a story around us that is going to attract companies and startups to come and collaborate with us to solve very specific problems. Another way is through a collaborative advantage. Some of them are just off the scale in the level of collaboration that's happening either in the district or between two or three innovation districts within close proximity. We look at that and we try to help them understand where would you like to push yourself and creating something very unique, very specific that can strengthen your advantage while solving very specific problems. 
So it comes with trying to understand where is their natural set of strengths and then leading with that. We found it to be so interesting during COVID, during the height of COVID, where there was just people were frozen, right? Firms were frozen. What does this mean? People were questioning what's going to happen to cities and downtowns. In the midst of that, these districts were receiving greater and greater investments given their strengths in biomedical and health sciences and platform technologies and very specific skilled, talented workforce and innovation infrastructure that companies, philanthropy, governments, we're saying this is the time to invest. So we started to track that kind of interesting investment during COVID. Here's another way that these districts are pushing themselves. They're pushing themselves by looking at different scales. There's the district scale. So this is Melbourne, the Melbourne Innovation District. There's the node scale, which is several blocks. So that's many buildings within that smaller radius. And then even at the building scale, one building, viewing one building as an important treasure in the story. So the level of intentionality about what's happening across these scales is what makes this so interesting as these places push themselves to grow and evolve. One way at the district level is to understand how walkable they are. They are pushing themselves to be these centers of proximity and accessibility and walkability. There are within a district great variations on walkability. So there's a focus now on how to strengthen walkability to connect people from different parts of the district in a much easier way. This is intentionality. This is considered an advantage for strengthening innovation, walkability. How about thinking about it as a destination. I talked about this with housing before, but it's also about the range of retail and restaurants and bars and pubs and cinemas that are there to have and hold their base of talent to keep and have other talent come in and to have community stay. It's all of these things together. Then there's another push around creating more porosity, which means the ability to move in and out of buildings more easily. Do you need a security badge or can you create the ground floor that's more open and allows different people at different times of day to use the space? There are some districts that are looking at their level of porosity and we helped in an early evaluation of nine districts to understand that. So if we have then the goal, if we look at sort of all these last little pieces that I just talked about, which is to become magnetic and yes, even more inclusive for a diversity of people, does it really stop with stores and housing or is it actually a much bigger play? Districts have said, and we've had many sessions on this, how districts understand their role to be centers of equitable growth and development. A big, big undertaking, but again, pushing on the values as to this is what we want to do, and this is actually a business proposition if we can successfully train our local talent into the workers we need. So look at, and this is, we developed this image, but it's not our idea. This was the image of how some districts see themselves. In the middle, the darker gray is the district. They're saying, okay, let's create a set of activities here that's gonna draw our residents in, we train, we support, we help, we connect. 
But at the same time, we help finance and support activities outside that help people where they are. They see themselves as a catalyst. And even if they're not there yet, that's where they want to go. Here's another image. I drew this image with the help of a designer, but it is not my idea. This is how a, a set of other districts are looking at themselves. They're saying, we need additional actors in the district that are thinking about equitable growth and development. Infusing in, pulling in new types of, of anchors to drive this narrative and help strengthen the work of creating equitable growth. So that can be health-based intermediaries, this can be community foundations, this can be different kinds of intermediaries focusing on diverse startups. The list goes on and on, but what we're seeing is some districts being very intentional on who is gonna lead and sit at the table to drive both innovation and equitable growth. My next few slides are really at a different scale. So that was largely at the, at the district scale. I think maybe I just have one here at the noble scale, which is another level of experimentation, especially for districts that don't have the critical mass yet, focusing at this scale is really important. And so if you see the red circle, this is in cortex and where they centered their focus, not the only focus, but this is where they centered a lot of intention, investment and effort was with seven innovation centers, technologies, programming, spaces for startups, companies, an investment back into the green spaces with programs and events. And there's that image again, down at the bottom to say, let's create a concentration effect right here and then spread with success. Let's create a sense of critical mass and then spread over time. I think this is brilliant and it's not just them doing it. We saw this around MIT when we met with the developers and the, and the head of real estate for MIT. We saw this in at least four or five other districts that they themselves understood this was their strategy to move forward. And then at the building scale, every building matters. And in this case, which is in Winston-Salem in North Carolina, they took a old manufacturing plant. And instead of just having an institution use there, take up the whole thing, or instead of just having one company take up the whole thing, they designed it for a mix from day one. And this power plant has become a center of gravity for other investment. So it's this really interesting way in which districts are playing with the market using physical, economic, and social networking strategies. This work is just, as a researcher, it's phenomenal to watch such great vision and execution and testing of ideas. And it comes with careful thought on how to organize. And so my last year has been, in some ways, becoming a lawyer. How are you organized? Do you have a not-for-profit? What are your special entities? What powers do they have? How is that linked with your ambition? This is what I did to try to understand their story from that view, how they've organized. And it just so importantly creates another way, another DNA, if you will, of understanding how these places are going to operate and how they're trying to achieve their vision and how they're organized. So the level of thought in this space is so interesting and how these places, let's just take these, are helping others understand that. 
That's also in how they're thinking about the physical transformation. These are just six innovation districts and boy, how they're playing on using so many different place-based strategies to make their district hum. So, so interesting. It really is almost looking at three-dimensional chess. There's not just one thing going on or two. There's many things, different levers all happening at different times, but sort of over time trying to create something bigger. And my last slide on this with regards to organization is thinking about how you're generating revenue. So you can finance things that are beyond just one actor, like placemaking and programming. And how, you know, they're testing and trying and seeing if it's enough where they need help and subsidies, where they need to lean on government, and when they can really try to branch out on their own. And so that is really then this sort of strategy for these districts, which is to help each other as part of our network, but to also think through where they want to go next. I could never say that all districts want to do one thing. No, they're so different, but here are some of the places or strategies or priorities, if you will, that many of them are wanting to take on. Some are saying, this is it. We are going to focus on how we're a catalyst of equity, given the level of inequity in our region. Others, given their strengths in climate mitigation technologies and the kinds of platform technologies and the kinds of companies they have and institutions, they're wanting to be leaders in decarbonization and very specific climate mitigation technologies. Others are pushing the, the dial on impact and sort of showing others how they're organizing. And for us, what we're trying to do as a not-for-profit is just to give them all increasingly sophisticated arguments as to why they're the right geographies for investment. And this is why we love as a group, a small group, but as a group, we enjoy immensely connecting these really interesting leaders that are trying to reconceive space, place, and innovation. And I'm gonna stop there and leave this now open for the group. Thank you so much, Julie. That's excellent. We have lots of great questions, and I'm going to uh, refer to our list of questions, and I'm going to read some to you and have you address them. And if we get through those, I have a lot of my own, too. So this is exciting stuff. So for our first question comes from Brian Matamore, who's actually on our board of advisors, and he, he wants to know, what is the actual definition of an innovation district? Or in other words, what formally designates an innovation district versus just a really energetic area of a city, you know? Right. So we had two definitions. I showed one. Yeah. One definition, this one was a more playful one, which is this ultimate mashup of different kinds of actors. But really underneath that, we looked at where places where you have R&D anchor institutions, such as universities and hospitals with a strong R&D composition, the extent to which they are clustering and connecting. So we're seeing a clustering phenomenon occurring in places in cities that have a levels of walkability, accessibility, and proximity. So we have measures that actually cover a set of dimensions that are not just, like my first slide, not just on innovation clusters and not just on place. So, so the, the entities and the stakeholders involved have to come together and draft some sort of legal framework that defines the innovation district. Is that correct or not correct? Not necessarily. Okay. So it's, um, and that's why we don't have that in our definition because it, it, they really start in very different ways. Okay. You will have some that start because they were given a gift of lots of land and they were happened to be around an R&D institution. And then over time, they decided they wanted to create an organizational structure. Okay. Others start right from the beginning, organizational structure, right? It's incredibly different how okay. they all start, but where we can define it 
It's around R&D anchor institutions and companies with an R&D strength, right? You can look at some of those numbers to help send a signal. Okay, this is a place. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So uh, my friend Warwick Peel from Melbourne, Australia is with us. And he said he loved your reference to the Mel Melbourne Innovation District. And uh, he also wanted to know if you were familiar with the Alberta transformation um, going on in Canada. Uh, There's a lot going on in Canada. Th there is, there is. And I noticed <laughs> you mentioned Mars in Toronto. Um, but he also mentioned Halifax and yeah. Ontario and, and, and how this relates to, you know, what Steve Case wrote about the rise of the rest and, and how these are really enabling infrastructure for really promoting innovation, uh, not just in certain hubs, but really spreading out like Winston-Salem, for example, that doesn't come as first to my mind as the innovation center, but certainly they're hey. trying to promote that, you know, uh, and, and I'm originally from North Carolina. so <laughs> Excellent. So, so here, here's here's another question: is, is is there a typical size for these districts? I saw in your your graphic they range from like 250 acres to 650 acres. Is there a typical, or are they all over the place? So part of the reason why we have this global network, so we have 23, is that we're we're actually conducting very detailed empirical analysis on them now. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is sort of sharpen the argument for what seems to be some ranges of where and why these places can accelerate. So, so put some more meat on the bones on both the definition, but also sort of what makes some of these potentially thrive. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you some initial thoughts. I feel that many of these are too large, right? They uh, have this big expansive area and then you have a lot of like, parking lots that they know they have in their plan to redesign. So what we're sort of in the process of doing is sort of walking through where within your district do you have hyper concentrations of R&D, networking, companies, startups, and those important intermediaries, how do you actually create a mini story within your district? And I actually believe this will be probably another paper coming out. I can feel it, so, which so is an ideal size. <laughs> around the small the, the power of the small okay so so yeah. closer to 250 300 acres is probably more ideal than yeah i'd even go smaller oh really even right? smaller yeah i'd even go smaller i mean i i think some of the stronger models that we've looked at of innovation district started at 20 acres and mm -hmm. then expanded up Okay, okay. So this is why, like the empirical work that we're doing now, we didn't do it at Brookings, we went really deep, and then we went really across, didn't get to the point of really looking at those metrics. And now we have this group that allows us to look at these metrics in a deeper way. Now, are most of the district anchored by a university or other type of, Yeah. that's usually the common formula is yeah. anchored by university? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay. I mean, I there's some places that are trying to be anchored by companies. And so okay. we're looking at those. Um, but it's not always an R1 university. I mean, you, you take yeah. Winston-Salem, for example, there's, right. not a, there's not a major research university there. There's um, a medical institution, a very right. strong medical institution that has an R&D portfolio that is actually quite attractive to industry. Okay. So okay. what they've done carefully is think through where their very specific R&D strengths, right? So this can be around areas in the biomedical and health field, and right. then having more industry attaching around them. So this is why it's so important to understand where you're really strong or where you're strong enough that could be attracting industry. Mm -hmm. And so the market is showing that in Winston-Salem. Now, now, I guess since a lot of these districts are informal, there's probably, there, there may be scores of them that you and I aren't even aware, aware of yet. Is that, is that possible? Or have you guys really dug deep to identify? No, there. I'm sure there's others, but honestly, what we're trying to do, I mean, we and we're trying to touch base with many, but I think it's really important for us to start distilling through greater quants, like what are those really interesting insights, whether it's minimum thresholds of density or levels of proximity or the extent to which you're wired with transit versus not, we're really looking at it at another level. So this is sort of the, the work and the writing that's to come. 
Yeah, because I imagine there's just many hiding in the woodworks in some places. So, so Brian wants to know what's what's the role of U.S. state governments in helping to create innovation districts? And I would also add like economic development groups. You know, mm -hmm. he's in Connecticut. They seem to be doing a good job there with the state government. What's what what's your experience there with the state governments? State governments in the United States critical. Yeah critical players, right, in terms of thinking through, often state governments are thinking about clusters, their state cluster strengths, where they could be innovating, how they should be putting money, putting in the right kinds of tax incentives to drive different kinds of investment and in innovation infrastructure. They can really be partners. And in fact, many of the districts in the United States have partnered with or connected with their state governments as an important player and pulling out and really unleashing the potential. In other countries, governments are not just helpful, they're essential, you know, national, strong national governments. Israel is a perfect example. They're the ones really driving it. Really critical with the local municipalities. And so in fact, what's happening now is they're playing with okay, we have these strengths. How do we create an organizational model where maybe we have the national government sitting alongside our municipal government, sitting alongside our R&D strong universities and our hospitals to sort of create this bigger round table, if you will. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, Haley wants to know, first of all, thank you for your insights. And they wants to know, do you believe that the Canadian supercluster model is counterintuitive for the development of effective small scale clusters? I don't well, know. If I, haven't, I mean, I, we looked at the super, we've looked at their cluster on the blue tech around Halifax. And frankly, a lot of the work that came from that, that cluster has only reinforced the, reinforced the work at the local level. Like right. there's been real work of really pushing institutions and industry together mm -hmm. and like putting money there. I found that really interesting, for instance, in Halifax and then how that then is playing down at a local level. So I don't I haven't looked at all of them, but in that case, we found it to be additive. OK, so so, yeah, smaller is probably better than super cluster. So so here's a here's a long question from Barbara. And she starts out by saying amazing data. Thank you. Mm. And the question is this, how do you see crime and theft as impacting the attempts of the small businesses to operate in these districts? Wow. I worked in Manhattan, New York City for over 20 years and saw it go from bad to good to bad again. The small business owners are literally being robbed daily and having a hard time operating in a safe and profitable manner. Small businesses seem important to these districts and how attractive they are. What can we do to help there? Big issue. If people yeah. don't feel safe, if there's high crime rates, that is absolutely going to be hurting the ability to create this kind of model. Uh, we definitely see examples where, you know, some of these districts are trying to create an organizational structure that serves like a bid, a business improvement district, but is not a bid. So it can actually extend beyond just the commercial corridors, but also into the neighborhoods and have additional kinds of support to make it higher levels of security, clean, safe as a way to try to get to the economic thriving. But if you have crime and if it, it's an, that is that has to be addressed. Yeah, I've seen it be a chicken and egg problem. You know, you, you try to bring in these assets to improve the community, and yet the nature of the community make hampers your efforts to bring this in. So it's like, it, you know, it's, that's a long, hard battle, I guess. Well, that and that was also the story. It's interesting, um, you know, Barbara, that you mentioned this because this was actually a, one of the reasons for the creation of what's called U City in Philadelphia was the, the death of a student um, right there on, you know, in areas where there's just a lot of academic excellence, but yet in the, across the street, you know, a tremendous level of crime. And it really pushed all these different institutions and companies to come together saying, how do we organize differently? This has helped over time. It's still not perfect, but it has created an organizational structure to help with the clean, the safe, the physically thriving 
with then the economic coming in. It's an interesting story. So yeah. that's U City. So yeah, and that's in Philadelphia, you said? Yeah. So so from an economic development standpoint, do most of these districts, or I may maybe should frame it this way, what percentage of these districts also feature a startup incubator to try to encourage small businesses to start up in these areas? Is that common feature? Oh, yeah. Um, 100%. Almost all of them, right? Almost all of them. And then here's the other part. Um, you know, as a researcher, oh, let's understand this better. We started to look at only these kinds of what we call intermediaries that are sort of working to support startups and companies or connect industry and institutions, right? Those that are holding the hands to help someone or set of actors grow. Those can be accelerators, incubators. They can be the ones that are working between, like I said, companies and institutions. We see in these districts a high percentage, much higher than what you would find anywhere else in the city of these kinds of intermediaries. So in some ways, when we look at these districts, we look at these intermediaries as one of those first, second things that we look at because they're the ones that are trying to build the ecosystem from the ground up. Okay. Interesting. What about well, the role? What about the role of yeah. of art and culture in the community? I mean, is 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 trying to integrate more art and culture activities and typically an integral part of setting up these uh, districts? I don't see it as core, right? Okay. Right. You see it as when it happens, it can happen beautifully. And yes. actually Melbourne Innovation District, they're having a very strong focus on how to sort of create that integration between culture, innovation, um, and other types of economic activities. Others are as well, but many of them are just thinking, how can we first right, create the basis of an ecosystem and make those kinds of first move investments that are gonna build that critical mass? I love, and this is an area we would love to look at, love this connection of the arts and culture and community and innovation. That's the mashup. I would right. agree with you. I would agree with you. And in <laughs> fact, uh, Warwick mentioned that the Melbourne Innovation District, I, I think, is hosting the Global Entrepreneur Cong Congress in, in May, that really bringing in some of the mashup of these different things and so forth. A mm -hmm. um, couple more questions as we reach the, the top of the hour. I mean, first of all, uh, I guess an, an observation from my experience, because I've done a lot of work designing innovation labs and, and yeah. locating innovation labs for companies. And, you know, in scouting locations, you know, I've gone to places and I felt the energy was dead, like an industrial park, just dead. And then I go to like some downtown district and I'm like, the energy's alive here. It's buzz. And like, this is, in my opinion, this is where you want to put your lab and you want to put like big windows and suck up all that energy. You probably see this in these districts. Right. There's just a buzz and energy, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I think they all have a very different feel. Ah. Um, and so, you know, I look at some of these, like what you're doing when you're looking at labs, where do you want to place them? I'm seeing a lot of these operators or strategic investors saying, where do they want to go? It's where they have this vibrancy to build. It absolutely. Up. Absolutely. And, and that makes, to me, that makes a big difference in how productive your innovation lab can be is having that energy. So I, I think um, looking here, I think the last question we have is if there are stakeholders and parties that want to join the Global Institute on Innovation Districts and become a part of what you're doing, how do they become members of your institute? The easiest way is to go to our website and it yeah. sort of walks you through it. So it's okay. www.giid.org. And, yeah. um, you know, we, we love to connect. So that's, you can reach out through us that so, way. So these parties, they become official members of your institute. Is that correct? So we don't, we're not a membership organization. We okay. are research, we are research first okay. and we're okay. using these networks to understand them better and help them accelerate and grow. All right. We use the network to help districts accelerate and grow. I understand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, there's a lot of feedback in the chat window. Thank you for your valuable insights. Thank you. Very educational, valuable insights, engaging, forward thinking. Thanks for sharing. Great session. Thank you. So 
with all of that wonderful feedback, I just want to yeah, say say thank you myself. Uh, is excellent insight, uh, Julie. Really, really appreciate you giving your time to our conversation here today and enlightening us about innovation districts. It's a great topic, and I love the energy in these places and the activities. And um, so we look forward to that. Uh, if if anyone has any questions, can they reach out to you with uh, additional questions? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm on okay. that website. All right, Julie, you Find can find Julie through the website. <laughs> All right. All so right. with that, we'll thank you, Julie. We'll thank everyone for participating, and we'll call that a wrap. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.